Hey guys, I am so excited to share that my new book, Motherhood Unstressed, is now available worldwide on Amazon, Kindle, and my website. And this was a book that I designed for every busy mama out there. It's filled with original quotes, poetry, guided meditations, and journaling opportunities, all as a way to bring you back to who you really are. You know, when you become a mother, life changes in innumerable ways. And I think that we all have that that sense of purpose and joy within us at all times. It just takes a little help sometimes getting back to that, and that's what this book is about. I want it to be a touchstone in your day so you can literally flip to a page, gain some insight, gain some inner knowing, gain some inner peace, and then go into your day and run it. And I so look forward to seeing where the book goes in the world. Uh, If you do get it, please let me know. Please let me know what you think. And I just want to say thank you so much for reading. When was the last time that you learned how to do something completely new? I know it's terrifying, it's potentially embarrassing, but there's something really valuable behind that, and that's what I'm asking my guest about today. I'm speaking with best-selling author Tom Vanderbilt about his new book, Beginners, The Joy and Transformative Power of Lifelong Learning, and we're talking about why engaging in the childhood joy of learning is so important, especially as we age. Sadly, our brains don't contain as much neuroplasticity as they did when we were children, but there is still a lot of value that can be gained out of learning a new skill. Now, Tom is a seasoned writer. He's written for Men's Vogue, the New York Times, and he writes on design, technology, architecture, science, and many other topics like the one you're about to learn about today. And my hope is that when you listen to this, it sparks a sense of curiosity a sense of adventure, really, and and you are inspired to go and take a class or learn something alongside your child, because not only does it benefit you and your brain, but I think when you model that growth mindset for your children in real time, it can spark so much joy, so many great memories, and really set them off on a course to do the same as they age. And I hope you enjoy this episode. Let me know what you think, either on Instagram at Motherhood Unstressed or on Apple Podcast Reviews, and I hope that you start putting yourself out there more and learning new things with a beginner mindset. Enjoy this episode with Tom Vanderbilt. Well, hello, Tom. Welcome to the show. I'm so glad that you're here. Thanks, Liz. Great to be here. Yeah, uh, I loved your book, and I think one of the greatest indicators that your book is really good is that Malcolm Gladwell endorsed it and said it changed the way he thinks about his own limitations. How did it feel when you heard that or read that? Yeah, no, I mean, there's there's no higher praise from you know no better person for for this kind of book in my world. So, uh, and that really was you know the sort of message, or you know, I'm not sure what the right word is here. What I was trying to accomplish with the book, um, obviously, there was my own personal story and all that, but I, I really did want people to walk away just feeling energized and that they wanted to go out and and I hear this you know from people, so I think it worked. Is that the minute they stop reading, they suddenly want to, you know, get learning something themselves. So, you know, while it was fun to tell my own story a little bit and talk about some of the science behind learning, I think that really was, you know, the message and and the hope is just to get people who I think, you know, many of whom were like me, just these sort of, um, uh, you know, kind of shy, somewhat, you know, shy uh, in terms of not wanting to look stupid in front of other people in in learning new things in middle age, um, things that can be difficult and that can hurt you. And uh, so anyway, yes, that's a long winded answer, but um, yeah. And it's so true because it's like, you know, you, you do geek out on so many different topics just because of the nature of your job as a journalist. And you're like, I'm, I'm smart. I'm always learning new things. Like I shouldn't feel like I've atrophied, you know, this part of my mind, but actually doing something and engaging something new is so foreign. I think like past, you know, past the age of 25, why was writing a book on that interesting to you? Because when you take on a book, I know, you know, it's an undertaking. It's a lot. Why did you pick that topic and, and give it your all? I, mean, I think it really stemmed from this experience I had where my my daughter, who was four at the time, wanted to learn chess. It was a random thing. We were in a library one day and she saw a chess board and I, I, I didn't actually know how to play. So I wrote, ended up writing a piece about that experience, about trying to learn chess with her. And I ended up hiring a coach, which I know sounds a little bit um, you know, <laughs> a little bit high. well, and also just, you know, kind of tiger, tiger father here, you know, hiring a, a chess um, master for a four year old. But I really, you know, I, I wanted her to kind of learn it the right way. And I, I didn't know where it was going to go. And I didn't, I didn't necessarily think it was going to be competitive or anything. But then I also, the minute I heard the coach, I, I suddenly decided, well, why don't I also try to learn this thing that has been has eluded me my whole life. And this is, yeah. you know, of course, well before the 
queen's gambit. And I mean, a lot of people are taking, trying to take on chess, which, which is a great thing. But I just, I was so struck by this whole idea, number one, of learning something together with, with her as, as we were both novices. But then it just reminded me that I couldn't think of many big new sorts of skills I had tried to take on in in the last, you know, any number of years. And of course, you know, like many people, there's real reasons for this, uh, lifestyle reasons. I was trying to raise a kid, pay the bills. Uh, you know, I, one doesn't have time to endlessly um, surf and all that. But um, but I think there were other things that were keeping me from trying new things, which were just, like I mentioned before, fear, um, thinking that I was, I was too old to be able to get any good at it, um, not knowing if it would be something I would really you know, enjoy, just, just those, that sort of negative um, self-talk. So it was really just this one little experiment that opened the door to thinking there could be a lot more things out there that, that would in some ways end up changing my life, but I didn't go into it with such high hopes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What is it about that fear that, you know, fear of being embarrassed, fear, fear of like feeling awkward and dumb that prevents so much of us? Because you're right. Like, it's not always a time thing. I always tell the women who listen to this show, like you do actually have time to take care of yourself, to do things that make you feel good. What holds us back? I mean, I think, you know, as adults, we're trying to present this veneer this you know this image of of competence and you know in, in our jobs and and you if you if you look at people's social media profiles like ranging from linkedin to instagram i mean it's all about perfection generally you know you, you don't want to go on linkedin and say well i'm, I'm an okay writer or something you know so <laughs> you know, we're, we're adults we're expected to be fully functioning competent people and then and then when you have a child you're expected to be fully functioning competent person in front of that child who is trying to learn a lot of things. And so you're always trying to be the teacher. But of course, you know, just the process of being a parent turns you into a learner as well as, as a teacher. So it's a, it's a very confusing time. And I, I think that's, you know, if I hadn't had a, a child, I might not have gone down this road because that that had reopened this whole world of, of learning um, to me. At the same time, I was also doing a lot of teaching. So uh, yeah, so I, <laughs> Uh, but adults, you know, the, this it leads to one of the problems when we do try to take on something new, which is that children, you know, get to learn in this lovely low pressure environment, which is, you know, smiling faces all around them. They can't do anything wrong. Um, learn at your own pace. It doesn't matter if you get good at it. You know, adults tend to take on things with very strong goals. I think, yeah. and, you know, I'm, go I'm going to crush this thing in, in a year. Or I'm going to turn this side hustle into a job things that can, you know, get in the way of or, or make the learning process less pleasant, I think. Yeah, it's it's like the intention behind the learning, whatever it is, is so important. So how can we reframe that, like you say in your book, to make it a fun, low pressure experience? I mean, I would say, number one, you know, just just do things that you, you really think you genuinely want to do that are not, you know, socially directed or things you think might be good for your career mm -hmm. or, or, or respectable or, you know, if, if there's something you know, no matter how strange it may seem, uh, and I'm not sure what that would be, but, you know, just, just go for it. Um, and the second thing I would say is just keep the goals very, very realistic and small. And I think goals can, we hear a lot about how important they can be, but they can also really backfire. If you, if you set these unrealistic goals, you'll then think that you're not progressing at the fault must be with you, where it really may be the thing you're trying to learn is just more challenging than you might know. Also, as adults, we've kind of forgotten what it's like to actually be a beginner, which is it's a skill unto itself, I think. You know, having that patience, uh, that tendency to keep pressure off yourself, to avoid the many negative voices. Um, so, yeah, th those are just the, – you know, and the third thing I would say is just join a class. You know, get, get out there with other beginners because they can be a great support network. You can learn from those people. The motivation is higher, I think, when you're – you know, sort of the going energy. to something yeah. Yeah, every, every week. I mean, it, there's nothing wrong with learning at home by yourself. And a lot of us have had no, you know, no other choice. <laughs> option the last year. Um, but it can, it can start to feel a little airless and, and you can just, you can just grow so much. And it's just more fun, I think, to have that, that social aspect also. Yeah. And I want to touch on what you said in the book. Like there's this leap of learning, this high increase of learning that you get right at the beginning of something. Like you went from never snowboarding in your life to being a snowboarder who's gone down a hill or a mountain. Talk to us about that magical moment and why that's so important to notice and appreciate. Yeah. I mean, one thing that's great about being a beginner is that 
what's referred to as the steep learning curve. And just to get, you know, kind of um, in teacher mode here, a lot of people think that means it's something that's difficult, but steep learning curve really just refers to, uh, you know, on a, on a, if you plotted it on a piece of paper, you would have time on your, your bottom axis and progress on your upper axis. So steep learning curve looks like it's going up a mountain. That just means you're making a lot of progress right away, which, which is a very powerful thing. And, and I think it kind of, reminds us and, and kickstarts and re-energizes that feeling of learning, that that muscle that many of us might have neglected. And, you know, it's it's a lot, you make so much more progress in the beginning than way up higher in those final stages of mastery where, you know, if you're already at 90% of a skill, it's a, it's a lot harder to get from 90 to 95% than to get from zero to 5%. So that, I think, just makes... It's something to be to be welcomed and, and cherished, and, and in my case, I think it sometimes leads me to jump around to a lot of different skills mm. because I, I, I get sort of a high off of that that first those first few weeks of, of just yeah. learning all the new stuff and new stuff to buy, new cool new gear, new lingo. You're, you're working your body in different ways, and um, but you, yeah, I think I've you know th- there's still those moments of embarrassment. I was just uh, up in Vermont and I went Nordic skiing, which is you know Ooh. sort of the slightly easier thing to do. The type of skiing uh, I right? have fallen over doing that. <laughs> I fell over a few times, but even before <laughs> I left the the little rental cabin, I sort of had forgotten how to apply the little sticker to the little thing they were giving me to hook to my zipper and I, I put mm. it on the wrong way and I was sort of like oh my god I just did the ultimate <laughs> and I hadn't even left you know I hadn't even gotten on the snow yet oh, I already perfect. Made, made a mistake so but by the end of that you know three hours or whatever I, I felt totally energized and I was ready to you know maybe on the next time there'd be those little hills that you know I couldn't figure out how to get up this time but so it just kind of you know reawakened that process yet again. Yeah. Do you think like moving forward, you'll always be looking for new things to learn? I mean, now that you've reignited this through, you know, playing chess with your daughter and learning that, like now it's always going to be like, okay, what else? What else? I think so. I mean, there are there are things that I, I have done for a longer time and have more skill at that I also like to do. So, I, you know, it's, it's I kind of, t- you know, compared to tending a bunch of different little gardens and, and actually um, – a friend pointed out that the word neophyte, you know, to be new at something comes from uh, the Greek, I believe, uh, meaning newly planted. Mm-hmm. So I, I kind of think all these things are little, little gardens and I'm, you know, paying attention to them sometimes. Other ones I'm letting kind of over get overgrown. <laughs> Other ones I'm fully invested in. And they're all kind of moving along at a different um, different scale. But, you know, I see, I think, you know, for most of us, the potential for growth is, is always there. We, I recently bought a house, my family and I, the first, we've lived in an apartment for many years. So we have this house, which the learning curve has just, you know, opened up again. And I mean, just the, the sheer fact that we have a garden yeah. has, you know, kind of opened my world and opened all these other doors. And, you know, it's not like I'm necessarily going to become a master gardener, but I am, I am very deep in the weeds already, no pun intended of, you know, just uh, mulching techniques, composting, uh, mm. you know, uh, pruning, grafting. Um, so I'm now watching Gardener's World uh, shows on <laughs> Amazon Prime. I mean, it's, you know, so I think, it, you know, it is a little bit uh, addicting. I think this yeah. is just what makes us human. I mean, humans were meant, you know, in evolutionary ways. We, we lived and we ranged all over the, the earth. We eat all kinds of stuff. We're very flexible and, and adaptable. I think, you know, we really relish novelty and, and, and learning new things. And it just, it just, can be a little fearful, but can also just make us feel good and energized. Yeah. But I feel like, you know, people like you and, and people like me and like the people that we kind of hold into our closer circles, we are like this. Like it's attractive to us. It's exciting. If we don't learn something new, if we're not doing something new, we get bored and, you know, then we fall into depression or something. So <laughs> it's like, I don't know if if most people are like this. I think most people like the familiar. I think most people like their old shows on TV and their routine. I mean, what is it do you think about people who seek the new that stands out from, I would say, the masses? Yeah, I mean, psychologists have this, they talk about these big five personality indicators. And one of them is this thing called openness to experience. And this is exactly what you're talking about. You know, people that, you know, to them, you know, a new thing is not something to be feared, but but something to be welcome. So it would be, you know, if you're going to go to another foreign city, you don't want the tour where a tour yeah. guide sort of carefully leads you around. You want to just do it on your own. And if you make some mistakes, look like a fool with trying to speak the local language poorly to someone. I mean, that's all part of the of the fun. And I mean, I, I don't 
I think that can be cultivated. I think, you know, there's probably a certain inherent nature there as well. But uh, what's interesting is that, you know, that that trait, openness to experience, is associated with longer life. I mean, mm-hmm. sort of, you know, like longevity. Because, you know, there's an idea that aging is an, yet another one of these things when you have to take on new challenges and in some ways keep growing. And what happens with a lot of older people is that they they fear that sort of moment where they have to learn something new, like like uh, learning a new piece of technology. So so they just yeah. avoid it. But that avoiding is 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 a negative thing cognitively because it kind of keeps you just stuck in that same rut, that same familiar thing. And I don't want to say there's a one-on-one relationship here, but I think there can be a greater risk of developing, you know, cognitive issues like dementia later down the road if you're not constantly taking on those new challenges and and sort of avoiding them because they make you feel uncomfortable. So, um, you know, we should just really, I think, try to embrace learning at, at any age and, and not think that you're ever too old because your, your brain still has that plasticity, not as much as when you were younger, but yeah. it never fully goes away. And I've, I've seen some quote unquote older people doing some amazing things and, and really not staying in place. And it's great. This episode is sponsored by Public Goods. Public Goods is your one-stop shop for everything that you need for home and life. Now, it's completely online. You're not going to find a store out in your neighborhood, but that's kind of the beauty of it in 2021. I would rather have everything that I need delivered to my door when I need it at an amazing price. And the other cool thing about them is everything is in this minimalistic aesthetic. So it's black and white, very clean lines. Everything looks really good in your bathroom or your kitchen or your pantry. And you can feel good about the products that you're bringing into your home. Everything is heavily researched. A lot of the packaging is sustainable, is biodegradable. They do a really good job at taking a more responsible stance um, towards the environment and towards quality. And of course, since you're a listener of the show, they're going to hook you up with a good deal. You get $15 off your first purchase if you go to publicgoods.com forward slash unstressed. That's P-U-B-L-I-C-G-O-O-D-S.com forward slash unstressed, or you can use unstressed at checkout. Yeah. What do you think is more important? Like doing the cognitive, expanding your mind through, you know, puzzles and reading and like a new activity or doing something more physical? Well, I mean, in terms of something like you know, plasticity or rewiring your brain, I think both of those things can, can do that. And it's not, you know, people often read things that, oh, this this will expand your brain. That, that's not really possible. Your brain has the same volume. It just kind of goes to different areas. If you, mm. if you do juggling, you might get a little bit more action in your sort of visual, you know, reflex areas. If you, if you learn a language, you'll get some more activity in in that part. But, but I think, I think both are good. What, what I really enjoyed in the book was for me, because I work with words all day and, and, you know, and, and push electrons around in my computer that I felt like I wasn't getting a lot of stuff with my hands done. Mm -hmm. And I, and this was one of the things I was a bit fearful of, and I would try to avoid when possible. And I would, it was easier for me just to hire someone to do some, you know, household repair or something. So working on something like this um, ring here, you know, it just really, I found energizing in a way that that was very different from, you know, reading a great book or something, which I, I enjoy, but just that, that I felt like there really was this two-way communication between my, my fingers and my brain that, that just got me into this deep flow state and felt very different from, from reading. I just felt there were areas of my brain that were not normally active that were being, called into, you know, into duty. Into service. <laughs> yeah. And I felt, and, and as a result, you know, I felt kind of tired. I mean, physically, not just physically yeah. tired, but mentally tired at the end of the day, but, but it was very rewarding kind of fatigue. I just felt like, wow, I just went through something I haven't gone through in a while and, you know, kind of forgotten about these wonderful things that we have, you know, our hands, tools, all that stuff. So I think, you know, just, they both have their, their benefits, maybe just within different areas of the brain and for different purposes. Yeah. And then like when you went back to the page to write something, do you feel like you had a fresher perspective or you used different words that you hadn't used in a while? Like did working on that ring with your hands awaken something else inside of you, like make your writing better? Potentially. I don't know. I mean, uh, Winston Churchill, you know, who was a was a great amateur painter and he's always sort of argued, you know, we sometimes think that people should people have hobbies because they don't really like their job or they really want something different from their job. But he he argued that you know people that love their job and I would say I do love my job that that they almost have a greater need to take on something different like painting to just to work those different muscles. I mean, it's sort of like you know in the same way that taking a walk can just you know give you that refreshing you know 
pause, introduce new new thoughts. Um, I, I really feel like, yeah, something like like jewelry making or, or drawing just gets me out of my head. And I I don't think I'm having amazing thoughts or anything while I'm doing it. I'm probably really thinking nothing. Uh, mm-hmm. And that, but that's what's so refreshing. And it's yeah. kind of giving. I feel like it's giving my brain a chance to, to take a break, rewire, think, you know, and just stop thinking a little bit and just be in the moment. Um, I haven't really done meditation, but to me, it felt like the act of drawing really felt, I imagine that is what meditation can feel like, right? I just completely lost track of time. And um, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I think a lot of people gravitate towards alcohol or something like that to numb the the mind and the racing thoughts, whereas you do something physical and you get that same hit, that same relief, really, that you've been seeking and that we all need. Yeah, I mean, I think, that, you know, what's what I loved about working on the book is that each of these things I was doing really worked different muscles, uh, you know, that, literally. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, and, uh, you know, surfing, even though it is, it is a motor skill and a sport, it also you know, got me in touch with nature, which mm-hmm. had its own meditative thing. Um, singing is again, it's a motor skill. You have to learn how to work your muscles correctly, but then there's this whole emotional social component on top of that singing with people, um, you know, drawing again, working with, with your hands, um, you know, swimming kind of similar to surfing. So yeah, it, it, it goes on. They all, they all really have their own unique benefits, I think, which are above and beyond the actual thing itself. There's always this other takeaway going on, which, which is, which is great. Sort of the value add, if you, if you will, of, of learning to do X is, oh, it also gives you Y. Yeah. If that makes sense. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the biggest things that I love about your writing is that it's funny. Like you have so much humor sprinkled in into the pages. Was that your intention or has, you know, writing with a bit of humor always been part of your style? Yeah, I, I, you know, I definitely have done things in the past that were a little more, let's say, I don't know, academic or a little like more dense. And I've been trying to tone that down. You know, I think you go through a period of, of trying to, you know, com- be competitive and show mm-hmm. how smart you are or something like that. And you sort of get away from just delivering you know the message should be you know it gets in the way of delivering the messages you want to deliver so um i think i've been trying my, my wife has been a great influence there just she's a ruthless editor and will just read through and and write like z z z z z across the top of the page when <laughs> she thinks it's it's something's going on too long um so yeah oh you know and you know it's, it's tough because some people want that deeper dive Others, others don't. So you have to try to find that that happy medium. But I, I was a little conscious of, of going to this book that it was really going to be this very self indulgent, middle age, midlife crisis kind of like no. here's a guy and his hobbies. So I you know, tried to, and, and or or that I was you know sort of uh, you know bragging about how how great I became at all these things, which you know newsflash, I'm not great at, at any of them. So you know, but it, but it, uh, so I tried to just you know tone it down that way, and hopefully, yeah get out of my own way a little bit. It just makes it so much more fun to read. And then, like you said, you really do get the message, you know, that underlying message that you're trying to convey and you still sound insanely smart. So wouldn't worry about that. But, (laughs) and, and and it was supposed to be, you know, it's a fun project. This is not, you know, like I, I, I point out in the book, these are not career building exercises. I mean, they, they can actually be good, I think for your career in that they, they make your overall life better and that you know transfers back in in a way but but this was not you know meant to be like a how-to book I'm going to teach you how to do this in 30 days here's this rigorous program we're going to buckle down and uh, but yeah just just to embrace that spirit of learning for learning's sake and that it was you're merely meant in the in the service of fun and whatever other benefits come along with that you know so much the better absolutely and has your has your relationship with your daughter changed after this experiment, after the publication of this book? Yeah, I mean, she's now um, the chess was a while ago. She's she, she's now eleven and is in that, that kind of tweener age of wanting to you know kind of establish more independence. But but luckily, you know, I think there were some early seeds that were, were sown where we're still doing things together and even learning things together. We've been doing a lot of um, indoor climbing lately wow. at, a, at a local climbing wall, which was, you know, which it's a great, again, another one of these things that's sort of a physical activity, but there's a mental aspect and like it's a solving a puzzle mm-hmm. as you climb on the wall. And we both went into it pretty much, you know, from square one as noobs and, and did things wrong and all that. And we're, and we're both, 
progressing and you know, we were going later today. So you know, the, the, that, that drive continues, I think, and hopefully, you know, I have a, a sort of, um, I don't know what the a wingman, <laughs> a, a wing woman um, for, for life, you know, of, mm-hmm. of just adventures that we can, and new things that we can take on uh, together. I love that. And, you know, like I say all the time on this show, it's like you can say whatever you want to say to your kids all day long, but they watch what you do. They watch how you interact in the world and, you know, the leadership that you're showing. Uh, I think that's everything. Yeah, I mean, I just um, had a quote. I just did a piece for the New York Times Parenting. Uh, it hasn't run yet, but about this whole idea of, of learning with your children, a, a new skill or, or idea. Um, and this is something that, you know, I think people you know, are sort of aware of or recognize, but it's really not that talked about out there. There's not a lot of research. You find the odd class here and there, like, you know, do karate with your kids or something. But um, but but a, a woman, at, a researcher at Stanford University, you know, made the exact point you're making is that, you know, kids pay attention to what we do more than what we say. So she used the example of, you know, a father watching television on the couch, telling their kid to go read books yeah. or whatever. You know, so, uh, but what I think I was not modeling myself was the very idea of, of learning. I was telling her how important it was to to learn. You know, oh, you should learn this, learn that. Don't worry if you're not good. But what was I actually doing in that regard myself? So I, I think this was a great opportunity to to try to model that learning and and demonstrate to kids that adults are not omniscient. They they don't know everything. That they they can grow and struggle and be bad at things themselves and maybe get through those things. And, and perhaps that teaches its own lessons on things like resilience and, and grit and all that good stuff. And, and I would think too, like self-acceptance too, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm your mom. I'm, I'm your dad. I'm trying to figure this out. I put my tag on backwards. It's okay. Like I still right. love myself. <laughs> I'm not going to beat myself up over this. And then they're like, Oh, okay. I can go out to the world and exhibit that too. Yeah. Cause I mean, kids, you know, there's been this increasing, you know, drive toward specialization and expertise yeah. and mastery among kids, you know, and you see that. And there's some interesting books I've been looking at lately that that, that talk about that and, you know, very stressed out children who sometimes walk yeah. away from these activities because they are burned out by age 12. And, you know, in some ways I, I feel like um, some of these things I've been doing are, are a gift in a way to be that I got to them later because now there's just no pressure. I'm, I'm never going to become a great surfer. No, you know, my parents aren't going to worry about whether I am or not. I can just do it on my own terms. So, yeah. um, but you know, not that I don't fall, you know, I, I've been the energetic, you know, dad on the sidelines yelling for my daughter to score a goal. You know, it's hard. You try to keep these things in, in check, but we're all, you know, we're all, we all fall for that stuff. I think also. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I love it. Okay, so we are coming to the end with everything that you've learned, with everything that you've researched, with your own intuition and sense of self. What is something that you want the audience to remember from this talk? You know, I think just to just to banish that negative self-talk ahead of time and and just to 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 you know, if I went into this book thinking how to describe this? Let's say, you know there was there was there was no one telling me you know five years ago that I had a, a potentially good singing voice or that I had an artistic side. Um, th- these were things that were so far from my own experience or, or life that you know if my friends if my friends heard that I would end up joining a, a choir and that it would be such a huge part of my life they would sort of look at me like what what so just you know I, I think people sometimes. Um, Daniel Gilbert, who's a psychologist at Harvard, talks about this thing called the end of history illusion, which people often think the person they are now is kind of the final, like complete version of themselves. And, you know, if if I had kept that mentality, you know, I just would have not have, I would not have done any of these things and would not have seen some of the the sheer happiness that they brought to me. So, you know, I think just don't, don't let yourself fall, fall victim to that or think that you need to have some talent that's already been revealed to, to start one of these things. And, you know, and, and that you can't find all kinds of pleasure along the way, even if you never become, uh, you know, a master after that 10,000 hours of deliberate practice that we're, we've all probably heard about. So mm-hmm. that would be the, you know, just, just, just get out there and, 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 and do it. Uh, it would be the kind of the basic advice. 
Yeah, it's a gift to yourself, a gift to your children. I love that. Beautifully said. Tom, the book is Beginners. It is a wonderful gift to the world. Thank you for writing it. Thank you for going through everything. And I can't wait for that article to come out in the New York Times too. I always get the Sunday paper, so it's like my favorite thing. Um, Where can our audience find the book and connect with you online? Uh, You know, I think... Pretty much all all good bookstores, uh, as well as the, your on, online outlets, and there's an uh, audio version. If you can stand the sound of my voice, you can hear me. But do you sing in it? <laughs> I, I, I I demonstrate some of the early attempts at singing, um, but yeah, that's <laughs> Which, awesome! Yay! Okay, I'll definitely yeah. listen to that. Don't be driving your car or something because like <laughs> you, you may go off the road. Uh, <laughs> Oh, I love it, Tom. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for your gifts. And uh, yeah, keep doing it. My pleasure, Liz. Thank you. You have been listening to the Motherhood Unstressed Podcast, and I'm your host, Liz Carlisle. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you love this episode, please share it with a friend and be sure to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts so we can get the show out to more and more mothers all over the world. <laughs>